The Dukes of Dice are brought to you by Tasty Minstrel Games. Check out all their awesome titles at PlayTMG.com. Welcome to the Duchy. It's time for another episode of the Dukes of Dice podcast, a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. Coming to you from BGGCon 2016 in Dallas, Texas, it's the Dukes of Dice, a podcast about board card and occasionally role-playing games. Today, the Dukes talk about their BGG Con experience, a bunch of the hot new games, and are joined by some special guests. And now, the Dukes of Dice. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Sean. And Alex. And this is episode 119, which we've subtitled... All My Hexes Live in Texas. Great job. Ned Meyer. For naming this episode. This is their... First episode name, and it made sense because they combined what we're doing and other things. Sean, you're a real charming fellow who deserves my utmost respect and admiration. Plus, you have better hair than me. Okay, well, anyway, so we're here at Board Game Geek Con, and what we're going to be doing here's the, the format of the show is we're going to be checking in every day to tell you about the highlights of, of that day, the games we've been playing, and stories that uh, have happened. Uh, and we're going to be lucky enough to be joined by some people from Board Game Media, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, I, I think. Well, actually, I know that because we're recording this after the fact. Aha! But well, it's sort of after the fact, like midway through the fact. Well, like after four, the fact for me, four midway fifths, through the fact for you. Four fifths through. Yes. Anyway, so uh, yeah, give it a listen, and uh, we will check back with you at the end. Or at least I will check back with you at the end. Yeah, I won't. All right. Laters. All right, well, it's day two, or morning of day two, so we're going to give you our day one wrap-up of BGG Con. So I'm here with Alex, of course. Howdy. And our good friend, Suzanne, your friendly local neighborhood, Suzanne. How's it going, Suzanne? Great. Hi, everybody. So what did you guys do yesterday, day one? So we started off right, because we started off with Cottage Garden, Suzanne and I, and um, uh, I can't remember his name, but another, uh, another guy who was uh, at the table, and uh, got in Cottage Garden from uh, Uwe Rosenberg. And Sean, shortly after we got that in, you actually ended up buying this game. I did. This is uh, Patchwork kind of expanded out for two to four players. We ended up playing it, or not two to four, expanded to three or four. Right. We played with three. You uh, can play with two. You could play with two, but I, I would probably play Patchwork over this at two. Probably. Um, three and four works okay. What I really liked about this is you're playing Patchwork, but with multiple boards. It's like a bunch of mini Patchworks um, with... with a kind of a give and take of trying to fill in your board. I don't know, Suzanne, what did you think of uh, a Cottage Garden? I really liked it. What I was surprised by, actually, is it, it, it's very light. This is a very quick, very easy game to play. It's very forgiving, um, and, and I thought that was a really nice thing. So this, it, it, it's much lighter than a lot of other Uwe Rosenberg games. So oh, yeah. it's, you know, it, that, that was a little bit of a surprise to me, and I, I liked it a lot. I quite enjoyed it, and I think, you know, if you like those, um, what do they call them, polyomino shapes? Is that Polyomino. Is that what it is? Okay, I think that, cool. that's what I've heard. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. If you like these games with polyominoes, uh, I think it's a great one to have on hand. I, I like, um, it's just cute in, in so many ways because you have the little cat tokens and you have the, the flowers that get planted. It's, it, it's, it looks great on the table. I don't know if it's cute or dark because we're doing unspeakable things to these cats. Oh, yeah. You're burying them in the ground and skinning them and all. Yeah. What the? Heck? You're yeah. using them as fertilizer, right? No. Oh, oh, my good gravy. No. Oh, my God. Although every time we would, every time Alex. Alex would play a cat token. Well, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I'm like, oh my oh, goodness, gee. what are you doing to these cats? Where did I hear that from before? My cats are are napping and wandering around and chasing mice, and then you are skinning cats. Aren't you literally? Disturbing. Aren't you literally burying them in the soil though to fill out spots on your board? Like you're you're murdering and you're using them to fill out space so that you can complete your board. Isn't that how that works? It's fell aside. I thought I read that in the rule book somewhere. Yeah, I I, I think you uh, I think I think maybe you should get some more rest. <laughs> So what's really cool, it has kind of a similar setup of patchwork where it has a bunch of these Tetris pieces or poly polyominoes, right, going going around the center board. But then also the center board is a 4x4 four four grid, and so that, that controls some selection of which tiles you're able to use. So lots of cool stuff to this game. I, I really liked it, too. For, for me, though, I think I'd continue to play patchwork at two players. And then if I wanted to expand this for three to four. Now, in terms of complexity, is it more or less or complex than patchwork or in different ways maybe? I would say it's it's clearly more complex. There's more rules that you have to worry about when it comes to cats. When it comes to clearing off the bottom row, you get a pot bonus. Um, the way points work, I think it's more complex than patchwork in that sense um, because there's m more of a rule set and changing out boards and this thing flips. 
uh, not to mention the fact that you have the cats that you can use to refill. So I think because of the different things in there, I would say it's more complex. I actually disagree. I think patchwork is more complex and strategic. I think managing your time track is is a much deeper mechanism yeah. in patchwork than what you have here. And and the placing of the pieces on the board, you're, you're right, there are a few other things to track, like how you're moving up this scoring track that is different and, and definitely has some depth to it. But overall, the, the placement of the pieces on the board is far more forgiving than patchwork. Oh, yeah. Um, very flexible. And so I think that alone makes it lighter. But yeah. that's my opinion. Uh, yeah, I kind of feel like it, like it is heavier in some ways and lighter in other ways, but close. Pick a side, Sean. I, I'm on the fence. I'm a fence-sitter. So another game that we got to play yesterday that Suzanne was nice enough to teach us was Honshu. Oh, yeah. And it was good. Can you tell us a little bit about Honshu, Sam? Honshu is um, it's, it's a weird mix of things, but it is ultimately a bit of trick-taking almost. Right. And then this city building, because the cards all have six different regions, uh, fields, forests, lakes, cities, things like that. And each of those regions score differently at the end of the game after you've built up all these cards. But to get those cards, you're actually playing them from your hand, uh, and then the highest card played gets to have first choice of the cards that are on the table to put into your city. There's a little element of resource management where you have these cubes that go into certain areas that you can move on for end game points and, and things like that. It's, it's simple, but there is a lot of meat to this yes. little game. And it's, it's really impressive on the table. And there are definitely multiple paths to victory, depending on how you play. Big time. Um, for just a little card game with a few cubes, it's, it's a great game. And it has that same kind of trick-taking mechanic that Pie Mouth Lowman or, or Plums has, where you're playing the card for its initiative to then pick the cards that everyone ha has played in that trick. And I really, I really like that in Plums, and I really like that here. This one's really solid. It doesn't have U.S. distribution right now. It would be great if that happened at some point soon. Yeah, I, I think that there's high hopes for that. <laughs> but yeah, it's it was really cool. Did you like it, Alex? I, I loved it. I thought it was really good. Uh, it's it's simple enough mechanically. Has this cool tactile laying things out. Again, another one that looks great on the table. And and the strategic decisions. It's interesting decisions in this one. Uh, I liked the decisions you have to make when it comes to resource management. Do I spend this to take first in the trick? Do I keep this here maybe to deliver it for points? Do I cover this over because I need to connect my lakes? There's a lot of interesting spatial decisions you're making with this, and I, I really like how it came together. A lot of fun. Excited to play more of this one at some point, hopefully soon. Yeah. So another one I got to play, which I'm a little bit less enthused about, was Pandemic Iberia. So this was the new one from Z-Man Games, and this is the, the you know pandemic system, but you're playing it in 1800s Spain. And there's some cool things that this game does. There are... Uh, some purification tokens that you can put out to prevent diseases from springing up in certain cities, which, well, I don't want to say what that's similar to. Maybe some other pandemic game that may or may not have spoilers associated with it. I guess I just kind of spoiled it anyway. Anyway, but there's also track lane, which is pretty cool. It lets you, so as an action, you can lay track down, and then you can move along any number of tracks as one movement point, which was, which was pretty neat. But ultimately, I, I don't know that I was that crazy about it. I think for my money, I'd rather play basic Pandemic, which is weird. That's not something I normally say. And still, I think, um, take Legacy out of the picture, I think that Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu would be my, my go-to Pandemic game. I, I like that a lot more. So I wasn't crazy about Pandemic Iberia. Um, probably not going to, well, definitely not going to pick it up. So we, uh, before we got in Hongshu, we got in uh, Mondrian the Dice Game, which uh, <laughs> looks good. It's, it's based off of uh, P.A. Mondrian's uh, kind of those cubist yeah. type paintings with the black and the yellow, the red and the blue. Uh, Suzanne picked this up uh, among a number of other games. So you, you, you definitely had a big stack, which was, which was cool to You're see. You're obsessed with her purchases. Oh, look. I'm not going to say how much it was. If, she, if she'd like to, she can say how much it was. Uh, but So we got this one in two-player. It certainly looks good on the table. I don't know if I liked it much at two-player as a game goes. Well, tell me, it's, 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 a, it's a dexterity game. Right. It's a dexterity game based on the art of Mondrian where you're, uh, you have dice that you're trying to land on these, this tableau of Mondrian-style cards. And it's a little bit of set collection, a little bit of, of dexterity, and, and it's, it's a little bit silly. I, I enjoyed it. I, I want to play it again, actually, but um, if you don't like dexterity games, it's definitely not for you. I like dexterity games. I just didn't... I, and this is odd to say with a dexterity game, but the decisions and kind of how, you, how you're getting dice onto the board wasn't as interesting as, say, 
other games that might have a dexterity element, Ice Cool has has more interesting decisions to me or more interesting ways of moving about the board uh, than than this did. So at least at two, I didn't like it, but I'd certainly be willing to give it a try at three or four or at a higher player count. Okay, very cool. Any other games jump out at you yesterday, Suzanne? Yeah, I got to play a game from Zoc called Dreams. And Dreams is a combination of uh, Dixit and a fake artist goes to New York. Ooh. And what happens is that there are cards that are similar to Dixit cards that are a little bit esoteric and weird and, and you know, their subject matter and art style. And then all the players get three of these little plastic crystals that you see in games, and one's like opaque and big, one's small and you know solid black, and one's small and clear. Okay. You get these three things, and they're stars. The theme of the game is that you are all gods building constellations in the sky. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and but there's one mortal trying to fool their way <laughs> into the heavens by tricking you, right? So you hand out these chips, and you know it secretly identifies who's the mortal in the game, and then. Uh, players take turns putting these diamonds out onto this skyscape uh, to mimic because there are four cards out with these different arts and you all know which card you're building off of but of course the mortal doesn't so players are one by one putting these these star tokens onto this player mat trying to shape the image a little bit just enough so it's the same rules with fake artists where uh, it's clear to all the gods that you're all gods but you know, the, the mortal, but it's not so clear that the mortal can figure out what the image that they're building, what constellation they're trying to build. That's cool. It was intriguing. And um, we played like, a, we played one game, but we played a bunch of rounds of it with, um, I played with uh, the guys from the Dice Tower, Z Garcia, Sam Healy, and Derek Porter, I think is his last name. Um, and and we, after playing a bunch of rounds, which we really enjoyed, there was some discussion of like, is this so free form and open that it is genius <laughs> or that it is really just a crapshoot. And, yeah. and I don't think we landed on a decision, but I will say I want to play it again. I do feel like it was unique and intriguing. So there's always that. So that's Dreams from Zoc. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So we got to sit down with our buddy Brad from Level 99 Games, Brad Talton Jr., uh, yesterday. And he ran us through two games that are going to be coming out early in 2017 that were both really good. Yeah. So uh, we played Anansi, A-N-A-N-S-I, which is a trick-taking game. He's calling it kind of a family, <laughs> uh, family trick-taking game. Although there's some different modes of play right. that uh, that can make it a little bit, a little bit heavier than that. But basically, you are you are uh, you have these six different animal suits, uh, different different values. But then there's also these spider cards mixed in. And actually, they're, the six they're, suits they're, are traits. Yeah, they're, they're traits. They're not animals, and they're it's different like animals. It's like bravery and strength, right? And, and each round, you are drafting some different animals that will give you a different ability for that particular round. And then there's an advanced variant where there's an animal plus a, plus a certain modifier on top of it. Small world style. Together. Right, right. And uh, so it's very interesting. And so there's uh, every round, you're gonna, someone's going to name a trump. Uh, particular suit to be the to the trump, and based on which animal you take, it also determines how many points you score per trick that you take, and then whoever also has the most spiders at the end is going to be the fool. You're named the fool, which you're is, a fool, Sean. Which is potentially negative points. It can trigger the end game, and if you get three, uh, if you're the if you're named the fool three times, you're out. You lose. You're you just done. lose, and, and the game triggers, ends immediately. It triggers the end of the game. It was really solid. I really liked it. What'd you think, Alex? Uh, I liked it. I definitely liked it a lot, and I like how there are different modes and different levels of complexity you can play with it. Right. So I think it's pretty versatile. The art on it's pretty pretty cool as well. I think it looks yes. Nice. Oh, the art the was game beautiful. looks great on the table. So yeah, the art was beautiful. And then there's another variant which we did not play, which is similar to diamonds, where if you play something off suit or off uh, off lead. It, you get the effect of that particular trait, which right. I think that would be really cool. I think that would be a cool modifier or but variant. A lot, yeah, a lot of game in that box, yeah. which I think is cool. And then we also got in Tomb Trader. Oh, this was really good, too. So this was kind of a, uh, it's kind of like Diamante, where um, in, in, in this, there are two sets of treasures every round. And simultaneously and secretly, everyone around the p table picks either inside or outside the, the tomb or the temple or whatever it's called. And then, so you reveal that, and then you all have one minute, everyone that goes inside, everyone goes outside amongst themselves, have one minute to split up the treasures. You can throw some money in that you start with. And if you can all agree on how you're gonna split it up, then you split it up that way. And there are some incentives to take particular items because they're worth points or they're, they match your hidden identity. Um, this was excellent. This was really excellent. It took us, what, about 30 minutes to play, I think? Yeah, pretty quick. And we had six players. I think it plays up to eight, if yeah. I remember correctly. But for this kind of um, little, bit of, little bit of bluffing and then the negotiation, 
and that that time negotiation. We talked about a game show. You brought up a game show a couple months ago yeah, on I the show the name of it. where where two people have they can split the money somewhere. Three people, you know, twenty thousand dollars. Well, I'll take I'll take fifteen thousand if you guys will take two or three. I'm not taking anything. I'm not taking right. anything less. Yep. So deal with it, or we get nothing. Right, and the money drains away every second that yeah. you wait. And yeah, uh, really, really interesting game. Uh, but yeah, that, that kind of fits into that category where either everyone's going to make a deal or everyone's going to walk away with nothing yeah. on that side of the tent. It was, it was really good. So both those games from Level 99 coming out, uh, like I said, early 2017. Last one to talk about. This one's coming out from Arcane Wonders. Spoils of War. Yeah. This was really cool. This is Liar's Dice with a little extra gamer element added onto it. So basically you're, you're taking turns being Viking Chiefs. And you're making, liar, it's basically standard liar's dice for a lot of it. You're rolling a bunch of dice and declaring how many dice total are at the table. So I'd say there's five fives, and Sean might go over the top. He might say, no, there's, there's five sixes and, or six ones. And, and the bid goes up until someone calls him on it and challenges. Once that challenge is out, then every other player, every other player is going to choose whether they're going to support that bid or challenge that bid as well. If you're on the winning side of that, you're going to divvy up treasure that's in the middle. If you're on the losing side of it, you lose your money. This had a, a definite feel of, of Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah, I call it the, the spiritual successor to Sheriff of Nottingham. Yes, uh, but it, it worked really well, and we, it, we had a tremendous time with this at six players. Yeah, it we was played great at six. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so that's not coming out until April from Arcane Wonders, um, and there's going to be some question of whether or not it's going to be a three to five player release, and then maybe a six player expansion. That's still kind of up in the air, but uh, definitely just keep this in mind. Like I said, it's not coming out to April. April is like a million years away in a lot of ways. But uh, it was really cool. So appreciate uh, uh, Brian Brian Pope from Arcane Wonders and, and Tony running us through that. And then uh, Berkey set that up. So we, we appreciate that. That was a lot of fun. Suzanne, any other games jump out at you? Uh, you no, know, I think that we, we talked about it. And, and I'm, I've got a ton of games I want to demo today. Yeah. So after we finish recording this, I'm going to go into the vendor hall and sit down at a few game demos that I've been really wanting to try. So I'm excited. So aside from the games, what else What else has been going on here? Because the cool thing is, you know, we're here hanging out with friends that we don't get to see that much from across the country. Any any cool stuff happen? Nope, nobody, nobody's going to ask me about my wolf ears. Oh, are you wearing? Oh, I just I yeah, didn't notice. So tell, yeah, tell us about your wolf ears, okay, so, Alex. Okay, so this was a saga. So for, for folks who may have heard on the show, I didn't really figure out a place to stay because I didn't know I was going to come here until pretty late, like a few weeks ago, and have not still technically figured out a real legitimate place to stay. So based on some shuffling, Matthew, who had booked a room here, uh, it was overbooked for just the first night, and so we had to go elsewhere. We had to go find some, no, somewhere else. No room in the inn. No room at the inn. Uh, and I was heavy with backache. So, um, anyway, uh, they, they gave uh, Matthew a comp room over at the Great Wolf Lodge, <laughs> which we took a van over to. And at the Great Wolf Lodge, which is kind of a, it's, it's like a Disney resort of sorts. They have a lot of water slides and kid-friendly activities. Uh, you, get, you get free wolf ears with check-in. So, so Matthew and I are both rocking these, uh, I don't know if adorable is the right word? Ador adorable wolf ears. So, uh, part of the pack. Yeah. Go Lobos. Yeah, yes indeed. We got to go to Hard Eight last night for some barbecue. I had the foresight to go like an hour before dinner, or at least start leave an hour before dinner, which was fantastic because it was there was no line, and as we were leaving, the line was out to the street. Yes, it was crazy. It was crazy long. But uh, this is the first time I went to Hard Eight. Last year we went to Babe's, uh, and Babe's is really good, kind of a little bit different style. We're gonna go there tonight probably. But Hard Eight was excellent. I had just a big Raquel and I had this, these big plates of meat. We ordered too much. We wound up taking home baked potatoes that yep. we didn't touch and some macaroni and cheese. But I had some pulled pork. Eyes and were some bigger sausage. than your stomach. Well, I, I we knew we were gonna take stuff home. I wanted to try a little bit of of everything, and it was freaking delicious. It was really good, really really good. So Suzanne, you you went to an escape room last night, right? I did, yeah, and actually we went to Heart 8 before the escape room and oh, got nice. caught up in that huge line, oh, thank you man. very much, that was, but it was worth the wait, right? And and people may not realize, that I, I don't eat meat, um, but I still love going to Heart 8. <laughs> they have this jalapeno creamed corn that is, oh my God, I could eat it by the gallon, it's so good, so Heart 8 was delicious. But we went to a local escape room, um, it was Marty Cannell, uh, Matt Evans, um, Rich Summer, Rodney Smith, um, and a couple of his buddies. I know I'm forgetting at least one person, but so uh, my apologies on their front. But uh, we did this escape room, and it was great. It, the theme of the room was uh, a terrorist had hijacked a train that ha was carrying a nuclear a nuclear device, Ooh. and so we had to 
break through the train rooms, get to the room where the device was, and then disarm the device, because they had activated the device, and we had an hour to do it. And we did, in fact, thank you very much, save the West Coast from annihilation, from a nuclear bomb. So, uh, well, Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. I like living. You're welcome. I don't know if you guys all realized, but last night you were on the precipice of disaster, <laughs> uh, and, and we saved you. So, uh, you know, there was that. We're John Travolta and uh, who am I thinking of? Broken Arrow. The Broken uh, Arrow movie? Christian Slater. Christian Slater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guy that everyone says I sound like. No, I can see that. Yeah. I never thought of that. I can I've see had, that. I've had like six or seven people tell me I sound like Christian Slater. Ah, yeah. Not in tone and not in cadence, but I can hear the, the, the tone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that's, I love Room Escapes. That's my seventh one. I am seven oh, wow. for seven. Are you really? I am really seven well, for seven. Well, there's an so. asterisk on one. Uh, which one? The one we went to in Florida. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which we would have won, but the, one of the mechanisms Broke, was, was broken. broken. Yeah, and so yeah. Uh, I count that as a win. Okay. Uh, you also pick your team very well, it sounds like. I go with smart people. And I mean, I'm definitely the one that, you know, there's always, there's usually one thing I manage to help with, and then the rest of them, I'm like, you guys, go, good job. You know, so it was a lot of fun. So, you know, that's the nice thing about going to conventions, especially things like BGG or things. Uh, there's, there's always a lot to do around, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right, well, we've got a busy day of some game playing and uh, some more dinners and things like that, so we should get to it. Peace out. All right, well, thanks, Suzanne, for coming on the show, as always. Always fun. Thank you, guys. All right, cool. Well, we'll check back with everyone day two tomorrow. Has this ever happened to you? Oh, no, not again. My steel's with my titanium, my titanium's with my steel, my heat's all over the place. I don't know how much money I have. This is just awful. There are cubes everywhere. How will I ever solve this terrible problem? Well, don't worry, Alex. There is a better way to play Terraforming Mars. Thanks to the fine folks over at Meeple Realty, you can play Terraforming Mars and stop worrying about knocking your player pieces all over the place. With their new terraforming colony insert, you have your choice of wooden or plexiglass overlays to keep those roving cubes in place. In addition to these vital overlays, the insert has special holders for the hex tiles and other components, plus custom markers for the temperature and oxygen levels. And you can even use their Meeple Realty Rover as an enhanced first player marker. The terraforming colony insert plus all their other amazing inserts are available now at MeepleRealty.com. Meeple Realty, think inside the box. So we're going to give a quick update about our Thursday experience at the con. Alex, how you doing? I'm solid. Rocking hey, in there. My wait, back's much better. Wait, wait. Who's that next to you? What? Who's this? Who's this guy? Get him. Oh, hey, hey guys. Good to see you. Hey, Chaz Marler from Paradise Paradise. How's it going? It's going really well. I am enjoying the con so much. It's such a great laid back atmosphere here. I love this one. And uh, you're doing a little bit of work while you're here. What 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 were you doing? Yes, I am. Uh, well, an um, employee of PGS. Yeah. Uh, I'm with them in March, so I'm in their booth, uh, you know, full time during this con from you know 10 to 6 each day, and we're demoing like five different games in there: uh, Quartz, Mythe. Pocket Madness and Civilizations. So it's been a lot of fun because we've got a lot, you know, a big variety. So we're not playing the same game over and over all day. Okay, very cool. So I'm, I'm just curious now. So you've got a couple months under your belt uh, with a new position. So how's that been working out? Kind of balancing working for Passport and then also, you know, doing your, your thing on your channel. There's been. Be honest. There's been a lot of long nights <laughs> this year, uh, but you know, all things considered, it's been such a sweet gig, and it's such a fortunate position to be able to be in. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay, very cool. Well, Chaz, what have been some of your highlights so far of the con? I think w one of the one of the biggest highlights uh, that you can get in a con like this is I got to play Concordia for the oh. first time, and you know, and so it's it's nice to be able to really get into a nice you know new classic you know, with that. <laughs> and I, you know, it was the first time I ever played it. Cool. And uh, I I really enjoyed it. It's such a tight design. Everything had a purpose yeah. and a repercussion. So that that was uh, so far I think my favorite new game I've played this this so far this con. Okay, new very cool. Game. Alex, what did your Thursday look like? So Thursday, uh, Suzanne and I actually went over to Bezier Games, kind of in the auxiliary uh, vendor hall, and we played New York Slice. Oh, which is delicious. An, it's, it, it was, in fact, delicious. Unfortunately, the pieces were not edible. Oh. So uh, how this works is you have a bunch of different pieces, slices that are going to form each round to create a whole pie. One player is going to be the slicer, and they're going to cut, and then the other players are going to choose in order and you're stuck with whatever's left over. So it's an I cut everyone else's shoes literally game because you're literally cutting a pizza with the slices. There's bonus cards that come in there as well, but that's the gist of it. You're trying to collect uh, majorities in different areas. So I want a majority in pepperoni pizza and someone else might want a majority in 
uh, everything pizza is, and someone might want a majority in, in these kinds. You don't want anchovies. Anchovies are negative points. So <laughs> the game was made by a bunch of anchovy haters. Uh, Components-wise, it comes in a foldable uh, pizza box, and then there's uh, the scorecards are little guest checks. So it's, it's, it's perfectly thematic. It's a really cool one. You flip over the back side, it looks like the back side of a piece of pizza. Flip over the front side, it has each individual slice on there with the numbers. So uh, cute, played quickly, and uh, really succeeds on components. I, I'm a sucker for games with really interesting components. What about you, Sean? So I've got a copy of Codex by Serling Games, the makers of one of your old-time favorites, Alex. Not old, old time. Not, not all time, but old, old time, time favorites, favorites. Uh, Puzzle Strike. And I've had a copy at home for a while. I haven't gotten to the table. And then so I finally picked up the, and I didn't pick up, I borrowed from the library the deluxe copy. And this is a card game that is trying to simulate a real-time strategy game. So it's kind of got like a dueling, you know, has a magic feel to it, but there's also a, a very abstracted uh, spatial element too. Like, a, like there's a map, but there's not really a map. It's very abstracted. It was really good. I really enjoyed this. Play with Matthew. He hated it. I think you might like it, Alex, and our buddy David at home will like it. But uh, I'm very excited to, to dig into that some more. One of the games that I played yesterday that I think Chaz can speak to was is this game of Vendor Bingo, where you're going around with these cards and trying to, trying to get stickers from vendors to fill out this card to ultimately get geek gold and win prizes. But there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a gamesmanship to it. What is your criteria for when you would give out a sticker at that booth, Chaz? Are you, are you a generous sticker giver, or do you actually make them learn about a game at least for a little bit before you give out the sticker? Oh, we take it a step further. I, I've been <laughs> giving them, I've been putting stickers on the other vendor spaces uh, on the card. So try to hedge our own bets. You know, hopefully they'll come back to us again later. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the approach I've been taking. So. Are you are you generous though, or, or if someone just walks up with a card and they're like, yeah, whatever? Oh, I'll fill in like three other vendor spaces, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, that's uh, I've only you know been kicked out a couple of times, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that now I'm off their radar because they're thinking I won't keep doing it. So I finished the game of a uh, vendor bingo yesterday. Twenty four different vendors filled out the whole card, went and talked to all of them. Wow. Even ones I didn't feel like talking to. <laughs> not going to name any names. Yeah, let's, let's go down the list. No, let's see if I can figure, see if I can figure it names. out. It's things that I just wouldn't end up buying. It's not that I okay. didn't like the person. It's just I don't I don't I don't buy dice towers. So, but I did fill out the card. Unfortunately, I have to be present to win, and I'm leaving Saturday, tomorrow, from when we're recording this. So I'm not going to be present to win. But I did get 120 geek gold, which is my only source of geek gold. I guess is going to be from, from filling out bingo cards here. Yeah. So I worked hard for the money, so you better treat me right. Can I just point out, that's like the fourth <laughs> time you've, you've said that. It might be. Can I just point out that you're incredibly clumsy, and uh, just going back to your dice tower comment, you, you do need a dice tower. Yes, and I accidentally kicked Suzanne's bag. So. Yep, just as Sorry, I said, Suzanne. just she as, as your I said, here. you're clumsy. Yeah, yep, it's true. <laughs> uh, yeah. Chaz, what other games struck your fancy? Well, I played Fuji Flush from oh. Stronghold Games. Uh, and that was that was an interesting one because you know it's a simple little card game, and it's you know the rules are simple enough too. Except for some reason there was about five of us, and only one person had played it before, and he taught, and we went around, and it took about three times around the table, before everyone simultaneously went, oh I get it, <laughs> and then boom the the race was on, and so that was really neat. That was a neat one, but that one took a couple of rounds to click for everyone. Okay, I've got it sitting in my bag. In fact. Voila. Uh -huh. But you have to play it. You played it, Alex. I played it last night. We had a group of uh, five of us. I ended up winning. But, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Really simple rule set. A lot of fun. You can kind of team up with other players. So it's sort of this shifting teams yes. kind of thing. Yeah, yes, yeah. Because if you put another, if you put a card down and another play, player plays that same number, you kind of help each other out for a little while. So you have that shifting dynamic going on. It works really well. I always love simple, elegant card games, and that fits the bill, for sure. So one of the games for me that was a must-play of the con was Oracle of Delphi by Casey Minstrel Games, for the record, a sponsor of the show. Uh, but it was awesome. It was really good. This was a Feld that I wasn't necessarily expecting to like, even though I'm a huge Feld fan, because it's a pick-up-and-deliver game, and I'm not a big pick-up-and-deliver fan. But I thought it was really good. And uh, you have basically these 12 objectives that you need to uh, achieve to win, and whoever does that first is going to be the winner. And then you're rolling three dice, which are going to correspond to some action selection choices on a rondelle, and you could spend some favor tokens, kind of like workers in Castles of Burgundy, to modify those. So there's plenty of of uh, luck mitigation in there. It was 
excellent. It was really good. Again, something I was expecting to just kind of be like, eh, it's, a, it's an okay Feld, but it was it was good. And Raquel, you know, Raquel's a big Feld fan. She she loved it too. Um, so that's Oracle of Delphi. I got in. So I, I got a rules explanation while I was on my vendor bingo card hunt. Over at WizKids, they showed me uh, a game called Rock, Paper, Wizard. Okay. Have you heard of this one, Chess? I haven't heard of it that one. Yet. Oh, you'd like this, Chess. How does this one go? All right. So, Rock, Paper, Wizard, you have these gesture cards out there. You're all competing magicians. The dragon's been slain. His horde is just sitting there. Whoever's closest at the end of each round is going to get a little chunk of his horde, okay. his gold horde. You are casting spells on each other, and you cast them simultaneously. The spells have different gestures, so it might be entrapment, or it might be um, fire, uh, fireball, or it might be a counter spell. And there's, so there's, there's attacking spells, there's counter spells, there's one that force you to give up gold, but you're going to simultaneously select and point at someone else to do something with the spell. And those spells might bounce off of each other, they might shove wizards back, they might shove other wizards forward, but they all resolve in order. It's a really, it really goofy experience, okay. but it plays really well. Sean, I, you seem to enjoy this one. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of silly, stupid fun. Uh, it looked like we we're all just doing gang signs at each other. <laughs> so when we're actually back in Albuquerque, we need to be careful yes. where we play this. Yes, and who you point at Yeah, with that fireball. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, be careful. But it was fun. It was cool. A lot of fun and, and a lot of just, yeah, fun chaos. But once, once they explained and showed it to me, insta-buy. And I don't buy that many games. You but this one don't. was an insta-buy. Well, is it all card-driven? or is it with, You mentioned being pushed back and forward. Is there a spatial element to it? Yeah, so there's a room that you all start off in the middle in, and you want to end up closest to the front of the room by the end of the round. Okay. Uh, but there's also a back exit wall that you could get pushed way back to as well. In between rounds, there's sort of a mini reset where you kind of move a little bit closer on both sides. Mm -hmm. I have it up in my room. I might bring it down. I, well, I don't know how long your lunch break is, Chaz, but maybe we'll get it in later tonight. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will keep an eye out for you. That what, would you let the man eat, Alex? Come on. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, so that's Rock, Paper, Wizard, one that I actually bought on site and ended up playing and really enjoyed. You guys also got to play a game together, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, Chaz, uh, I wandered over to the Passport game booth, and I asked Chaz, uh, Chaz, what is your favorite of these games to play? And uh, that would be uh, Quartz of the ones that we have out right now, and that perked your interest enough that you sat down and uh, let me teach you how to play it. Well, when the great Chaz Marler says <laughs> it's his favorite game of the bunch, you have to listen, you have to sit down, and you have to play. So, yeah, we got a nice four-player game of that going. Uh, explain to folks, since you've explained it plenty of times, I'm sure, this con already, how's that one go? Okay, let me see if I can remember. Oh, okay, in Quartz, uh, it's nice that you have a bag, an opaque bag, full of these colored gems. And so you are basically pushing your luck to pull as many uh, colorful gems out of this bag as possible. But there's also these black, worthless obsidian in there, which if you draw one, you're okay still. But if you get stuck with another one, a second one, your bag rips, all your gems fall back into the mine, and you're out of the round. And so you're trying to collect as many without having that happen. But meanwhile, your opponents can also be playing these cards, which can take some of your gems or actually give you more of the bad obsidian to knock you out of the round faster than you'd think. So uh, it, it's just kind of this fast-paced, fun little game with a lot of, oh, while you play it. Yeah, and a lot of uh, card, counter card. Yes. Hey, you, hey, I'm giving you this obsidian. Oh, wait, nope, that obsidian's going somewhere else. Hey, I'm going to steal from you. Actually, no, I'm playing this card that when you're stealing from me, actually, I get to steal one from you. Yeah, it, it has um, the, the mechanism in it. I like A lot of people call it push your luck, but the way I like to describe it is controlled chaos. I uh, love games that can give you a sense of controlled chaos. Yeah, and, and definitely fit the bill. Had, had a good amount of fun with that one. Got my butt handed to me. I was leading heading into the last <laughs> round, and then everyone, like, it just curb stomped me. It wasn't good. It wasn't good. But it was reasonably close scores, and it was definitely a lot of fun to play. And you can't ask for much more than that. So that was uh, that was Quartz. And you seem to think I'm going to like it reasonably enough. I think you would, yeah. Or, or not more than that, I guess. Yeah, I, I think you'd like it. Okay. Well, cool. I, I just wrote that down so I can go check it out uh, while I'm at the con, because that sounds, that sounds pretty cool. Chaz will teach you, too, because it's his favorite. All right. And he'll even play. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. So the last thing I just want to talk about real quick is I got to play a game of my number three game, Zulkin, the Mayan Calendar. I got to play this with uh, our buddy Berkey, and uh, I lost. So that's it. We're moving on. <laughs> last one I want to talk about, Baseball <laughs> Highlights 2045 Tournament. Played a little mini tournament. It's the worst I have ever played in that game ever in a tournament. Oh. Uh, I lost every series I played in uh, two to one and lost overall three and six record. Lost two of the games in extra innings against Berkey. Oh, it was heartbreaking. I don't like doing badly at my favorite game of all time. 
First mention? Yeah, first mention. I just I got that in there. Baseball Highlights 2045, first mention. Okay. Anyway, so got that in. Anything else, Chaz? Uh, no, that's it for now. I think I'm going to go grab something to eat before I fall down. All right, please do. We need you in this hobby, Chaz. <laughs> Hang in there, buddy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. So All much. right. Thanks, Chaz. Thanks, Chaz. All right, well, we're actually going to do our Friday update on the Friday, which we haven't been doing so far. What? I don't know why I keep... I'm obsessed with like the time of all this. Anyway, so uh, it is Friday. It's Friday night, and there is actually a giant Tyrannosaurus Rex walking through the halls right now. There is the awesome Dice Tower Battling Tops tournament going on, and it's pretty crazy. But we're here to talk about what we've been playing, and we're joined by our buddy Marguerite Cottrell. Maggie Bot, how you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. So uh, we're kind of talking about highlights of the con so far, or maybe highlights today for us, but what what's so far been your highlight uh, some of your highlights of the con. So every con, you kind of like you pick out a couple people to meet. So I got to meet some friends from Twitter because that's where I meet everyone. Sure, that's sure. Where I live. Um, I got more meeples included this this year toward the con than ever before. The wonderful Nethers plays got here to this year, so it's her first BGG. Awesome. It's kind of fun to always kind of walk people through their first BGG. Um, I have taught Capital Lux more times than I can count. That game is so good. Oh my god, it's amazing, but it's. After a while, you don't want to teach it anymore. You want to play it. Did we talk about that yesterday? I don't think we actually talked about it. You may. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I haven't played it yet, but you have. And oh, you I haven't really, played it. I, I really want to. So, Maggie, can you tell us a little bit about how Capital Lux Can you teach plays? me how to play it I, I, right now? Right now. I will do that. Um, but I will say, though, that this is another amazing, beautiful game with oh, Quanchai yeah. Mori yes. Moria Art. Is Moria? Quan Quanchai Mori. Mori. Uh, yeah. Quanchai Mori, I believe. Uh, beautiful, beautiful art. It kind of looks like a Tron type aesthetic on the box and um, it's from Aporta Games. It's coming into the States into distribution right now and it's just a little like hand management kind of game and it's very interactive and cool and a little mathy and just beautiful. Um, but like I said, I, I literally taught it probably 12 times. Cool. Yeah, I've so. played it once so far. I, I picked it up and it's awesome. I think yes. it's just, just a fantastic game. And then um, yesterday morning, my friend Daniel taught me a game called Role Player. Oh, yes. Yes. He taught me that, and I immediately turned around and taught another group it, because it's amazing. And it's basically just character creation, the medium, lightweight Euro, right? So it's dice drafting, and then you kind of use your abilities to make a cool character. And they have a frog kin promo that I now need. Oh. I don't have I don't, it. I don't have that either. I need it. I played it as a frog kin yesterday. I don't own it. I don't own it or have it, but I played with it. It's in the library. Library copy has it. I was going to jump you if you had your frog kin. I was going to take it. I don't own it. I don't buy anything. You sure yeah, tell yeah, that. I don't like, <laughs> That's what we're here for, Sean. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. It's it's. He bought like a couple things this week. Ooh. But but role player. One yeah. thing. To, oh, be, okay. to be clear, one thing. Right, my, Rock my, paper my, wizard, and that was it. My mistake. But yeah, role player is really excellent. It's it's surprisingly excellent because most people have not heard of this. Um, it's like Keith Mateika, Mateika, Mateishka, yeah, something like that from and, Thunderworks. Right, and they had done Bullfrogs before, and that was a pretty decent title. But it was super like low key, and no one really heard of it. Now, role players sold out everywhere. I am like, I, I was at lunch the other day, and we were like sitting around talking about how much everyone wanted a copy. I have a copy, by the way. Um, but I, I looked around the table and I was like, okay, we've got about nine different zip codes. I want everyone to get on their phone, call their <laughs> local game store. No joke. Everyone got on the phone, called their local game store, and we found my friend a copy. Nice. Yes. So Tony now has a copy, thanks to, um, gosh, I wish I could remember the store's name in Dallas right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was really happy to be able to do that. So I had placed an order for it through Miniature Market. They oversold it. I didn't get mine. I reached out to Keith on Twitter, and he was able to hook me up. It's, I mean, high, high in demand, so I, I, I paid Collusion. for it. Yeah, Collusion. Yeah, but I paid for it. Collusion. I paid for it. Okay. And it well, was awesome. Talked I paid to Paid for mine at work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, taught it to Raquel. Raquel loved it, right? Absolutely. And uh, by the way, Raquel joining us. Yeah. Hi, Raquel. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I've actually so I played it twice so far here, and I've played it I think four times in the last like week and a half, and it's great. It is just super, super good. And we're probably gonna do well. A spoiler, but we, I guess we'll we'll review it at some point in the near future. Probably, but I I've gotten two I plays like, in it already. I like it somewhat. Hey, I'll let's just... review it now, Sean. What do you give that game? I don't want to say. Anyway, all right. Um, so yeah, role players. What? Role oh, wait, wait, really wait. Awesome. Say that, Raquel. I think it's one of my favorites. Really? Yeah. Oh, one all right. Play. One play, and I can say that. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Interesting. Um, Alex, what have you been playing today? Uh, I've played a bunch of things. I'll start off talking though about Glux. I walked right in, sat Glux? right down. Glux. G L U X. Queen game, uh, abstract, 
your objective is to light up rooms. It's an area control in a different way. You are going to be drawing uh, effectively dice. So it's either a five or two, three or four, one or six. And you're going to place it down a number of spaces away from another one that's already placed on the board. So there's a six on the board. You place another one six spaces away. Your objective is to move into other rooms. You can't move through other players, but you can land on top of them, covering them. You can't move through if it's uh, stacks of two. You play everything out and then score. A lot of fun, really simple rule set with this one, but decent amount of depth, interesting decisions, and, and plays really well. I don't Have you played this one yet, Maggie? Oh, no, I saw it, but I have not played it because it has been really, really busy the whole yeah. time. Yeah, the I'm whole time. I'm surprised you were able to get a, get a seat at the table. In the morning, if you go in the mornings at anything at BGGCon for the most part, I think you can pretty much get a seat at the table because everyone sleeps in. And so it was the first thing I did. I walked right in. There was no one there. Two other people quickly sat down. We got in a game, three-player game of it. Ton of fun. Highly recommend it. Give it a look. It, it, this was one of my games of the con. I don't know what oh, my game wow. of the con is yet. It, it's up there. Okay. Really fun. All right. Very cool. Well, nice and elegant. Well, this morning, uh, 8 a.m., I got to play Cuba Libre with uh, with Matthew. <laughs> Maggie's laughing. That it, Sorry. It's yeah, really funny. Yeah, it is really funny. But we had this set up. So uh, Travis from Low Player Count and Matthew uh, and uh, Mark. And uh, so I've played this solo three times. I actually ran through, through the tor tutorial twice. And then I tried it with three bots, which was a horrible, horrible <laughs> mistake. Yeah, it was. I had no idea. No one told me. No one told me that was a bad thing. And it was horrible. It was like I did like they six rounds. Wanna, they just wanted you to do that. I did six rounds in like in four hours. But anyway, so... I finally get to play a real play today with with actual real people, not stupid bots, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It uh, this is one of those coin series games. We talked about this on the show, I don't know, a couple months ago, and uh, it was really really fun to finally get a feel for the system. I feel comfortable with it. I don't feel good at it by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I feel comfortable at least teaching and kind of. Uh, um, shepherding other p players through back home. So that's going to be really cool. But it's uh, counterinsurgency. It's uh, it's the Cuban Revolution. Uh, it, it's it's really excellent by GMT. And, uh, yeah, have you played any of the coin games, Maggie? Um, Cuba Libre, Libre is the only one i played. Okay. And so it's just not quite my bag. Sure, sure. Not, not yet, at least. I mean, I just don't have the group for it, I don't think. High five! Okay. Yeah! Well, Take I that, was, Sean. I was, I was kind of scared because I... Th <laughs> I th after playing it the, the couple solo times that I did, I was uh, there are some mimes that are that are about to murder us. They're surrounding us. Oh no! Oh my goodness! They're, Come they're, with us. Okay. Oh oh! You can't hear them. They're, they're doing. Pe they're peeking over but a wall. Trust me, it's entertaining. This is this is odd radio. Yeah. And I'm a little. This feels like the purge. Are we in the purge right now? Oh uh, yeah, it's possible. I'm, no. Okay, no, not in the purge. Okay, bridge. good. Yeah, I'm good. really glad. Yeah, aw. Okay, we just yep, fist, bump fist bumps with explosions. <laughs> virtual fist bump. Virtual fist bump. Yep. And tip of the caps. Yep, that'll work. Boom. Yep, I'll take all that. Sweet. <laughs> all right. Excellent. Excellent podcast. So, yes, it was doffing the cap. Thank so you, Maggie. Bye. My point. What was my point? Oh, my point was that <laughs> after playing the several times the coin game, Cuba Libre, the several times that I did, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm actually going to like this. But it was just such an awkward playthrough of by myself. After today, I did like it, and I've got Liberty or Death at home, and I've got Falling Skies, the Fall of Roman Britain. No, Gaul. The row of the Fall of Gaul, Roman Gaul, uh, at home. So I'm very excited. What? Chewie hasn't gotten a hold of it. Yeah, say, yeah. say it again. If Chewie hasn't gotten a hold of it. Yeah, our game room is probably trash right now by our two two and a half year old. Um, or Carmen, you know, you never know. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Carmen's Carmen's Raquel's mom. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was very exciting, and I appreciate Travis taking the time to, to walk us through that. Uh, Maggie, what else, any other highlights you can think of? Okay, yeah, because this one I will never be able to play at home. I will never be able to own it, but I really, really want other people to own it. Have you played Flamme Rouge? No, I haven't. Holy moly. Let me tell you, because if, if you could imagine someone sat down one morning and said, hey, I want to I imagine everything there is to do with a bike race, all of the troubles, all of the the thoughts and strategy that goes into a bike race and then make it into a really elegant card game, he did it. He just done did it. And Flammers was really, really, really cool for a racing game. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so you basically, like, everyone has a, 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 a deck of cards and they're all identical. Um, there's a roller and a sprinter, or a roulet and a sprinter. It's all in weird French and um, not the kind of French I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very specific kind that you can't speak, and this is just not it. I can order food. Oh, okay. <laughs> and her name's Marguerite. Ah. Yes, that's true. Um, so in this one, you, you, you choose a, a card for both your, your roller and your sprinter, 
and everyone does that at the same time, and then you resolve them from front to back of the Peloton, which I only know that name because of a board game. Um, Peloton is from Leader of the North, or H Hell Leader of the North, or... There was a there was a basically game a while back that had the word Peloton and I had to Google, but <laughs> <laughs> um, and then everyone is moving their little bikes bikes along and if you're one space away you kind of draft and you push yourself forward which is kind of cool but if you're going uphill that doesn't happen and the person in the lead it's an exhaustion token and when you're going downhill you have like a minimum or a max or a minimum amount you have to move and it's just a really really smart game <laughs> and if you don't take those exhaustion tokens you can run out of cards. <laughs> I, I darn ran out, of, uh, ran out of cards for one of my bike, bicyclists today, and someone else really smartly grabbed a bunch of exhaustion early, used them kind of mid-game, and then sprinted at the end to the win. It was really, really, really cool. Okay, cool. Flam, Flam Rouge. Yes, F-L-A-M-M-E. -M -M -E. Is, is, what's Flam? I mean, Rouge is red. What's oh, it's, so the, the flag that they wave at races, ah. that's called the Flam Rouge. Okay. So yeah. Flam is flag? Y well, I and don't flag know. is Flam? No. <laughs> And now you learn something today. <laughs> or or not. Maybe not. Any other games for you, Alex? Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Quite a few. Okay. Uh, Tiny Epic Quest. I got a full play of Tiny Epic Quest. Now, still on Kickstarter, I think, even when this episode drops. It is. It should be, I think. Yeah. With, uh, with the special item meeples. And this is the Legend of Zelda-like game done in Tiny Epic Quest. Uh, there's always a different mechanic for this. This one has some pressure luck to it. Uh, but it's also a, it's kind of a puzzly movement game in an odd way. How you're moving around the board is, is a puzzle you have to solve each round, where you want to put things. Uh, but the pressure luck is also the core of the game. There's a day phase and a night phase. Day phase, you're moving your guys around. Night phase, you are uh, rolling dice and trying to figure out stuff and resolve things. Uh, got in a full play through this. Like it. I'm strongly considering backing it, except for the fact that just about everyone else has backed it, and that usually is enough for me to just freeload off of other people. Yep. That's how sure it goes. Is. Sorry. Uh, but I may back it just because I like the Tiny Epic system, and the components of this are going to be straight up gorgeous. They're already gorgeous in many ways. The item meeples themselves are really cool. Uh, there's like a little tiny bomb you can attach to someone's hand and a shield. And, uh, and a shepherd's crook or a cane or an, and a lantern. A lot of cool customizable options. Just for the cool toy factor of this, that alone may be worth backing this. Uh, great job, Game Lynn. This is going to be awesome. Those of you who've already backed this, you're not going to be disappointed, I don't think. Good, only good things to say right now. Okay. Very cool. I also got in a play of Evolution First Beginnings. Uh, Dominique Crapuche from North Star, kind enough to show that to me. That was... Really fun, and I think a lot of folks were thinking that's just going to be a family game and way too basic. And it, it ends up having it uh, still a decent amount of depth, but streamlines a lot of the rules. You only play with uh, 10 traits. Uh, this, it's pretty simple how food gets added to the watering hole. A lot simpler of a game, a lot shorter of a game. Um, if you're a gamer, it's still going to work as kind of almost a, almost a filler evolution, oddly enough. A uh, decent amount of fun, and... and plays more elegantly than normal evolution does, and I enjoyed that. Yeah, and it was actually great to meet Dominic, because we've had him on the show a couple times, and uh, talked to him, emailed him, so it was good to actually finally you know, meet him, shake his hand. That was really cool. So, uh, Evolution Beginnings. Um, so, let me just real quick talk about two other games. I got to play House of Borgia by Game One Games and Talent Strike Studios, so kind of a, a joint production there. The Jasons, uh, Jason Hancock and Jason Washburn, ran me through that, and it's a very cool Liar's Dice Type game, multiplayer liars dice, kind of What's like with all the liars dice well, games. Yeah, because we, we talked about the other day, uh, Spoils of War coming out from Arcane Wonders, but this is a little bit, uh, a little bit shorter, a little bit more streamlined, and when you bid uh, number of dice, like in liars dice, you're actually going to be taking an associated action if the person to your left doesn't call you on it. And there's also a hidden role element where you're one of the the cardinals because it's the, the Borgias, one of the cardinals out there is, is who you are, and you're trying to kind of manipulate them, move them in order, get them some different influence points. It was really cool. I liked it I liked it quite a bit, and that's going to be fulfilling uh, from Kickstarter the next couple weeks. It's on the boat, I think. So that was really cool. And then, um, do you want to talk about Adrenaline? Heck yeah. Did you play Adrenaline yet, Maggie? No, I haven't. I played Ave Roma instead. Sorry. Why are you embarrassed? Because I should have played Adrenaline by now because it's like an hour-long game and it's really, really fun and awesome and everyone keeps talking about it. It was it was pretty cool. What did you think, Alex? Yeah, so I will say this. There are a few games where I can physically feel like the heat rising into my face. Oh, in man, moments. you were so mad. I was so mad. And, and it doesn't happen with every game. Like Colt Express, you could punch me, knock me around, send me. I lose everything in that game and finish in dead last. And in Colt Express, I won't care. And for some reason in this one, when Matthew, with his wolf ears, wolf ears Matthew, 
uh, knocked me out in that, and just in that moment, I just like the steam rose. I spent no like the rest of the game focused on just murdering him as best I could. It, I finished in dead last and by a mile dead last. In this game where all we're supposed to be doing is shooting the crap out of each other. Yes, it's a first-person shooter simulator into a board game and does a decent job of that. What I think is really cool is how, how every weapon in the game is unique and acts as you'd expect. Some really cool concepts in there with how it works. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun. I had, a, I had fun with it, ultimately, but because it made me so angry in the moment, I'm hesitant to play it again. <laughs> because it reminds me of nothing personal just because of what? that kind of... No, that kind not because Jeez. the game's at all similar... But because it's that kind of a game that can get me really annoyed. This was like the first-person shooter version of Diplomacy. I'm not saying they're similar games. I'm saying the emotion I get out of it is similar. Okay, we're never playing Diplomacy together. That's it's fine. Just not, it's oh, no, no, not, no, no, no. That ain't ever happening. Yeah, no, no. Anyway. Uh, yeah, uh, it's good. It's a lot of fun, but it, but it makes me angry. Okay. Especially at Matthew. Oh, Matthew. So, Maggie, any other... Strangling any other, you in your sleep tonight, Matthew. Any other games jump out at you or just cool experiences so far here at the con? Um, you know what? Just a lot of... BGG is all about just hanging out with people, so I've, I've made it a, a, a lot of new friends from Twitter that I know in person and can recognize my face now, so that's always a good thing. And I got to learn Navigador, finally. Navigador. Navigador. I thought I had played it before. Um, I honestly had crossed off my list of, of Mac Guards games I had played. Uh, I had played Ike, uh, Antique and Antico Duellum, and I thought I had played Navigador, but I hadn't. And it works amazingly well at two players. Cool. I, I never thought that. It's like an economic Rondell game. Right, right. So it's one of the older ones, but it still holds up. I loved it. So that's the second Mac Gertz game that's been talked about today. That and uh, Concordia. Right? Wow. Concordia? Matt Gertz? Yeah, yes. Yes, okay, I thought so. <laughs> Most I'm definitely, like, and that is I'm probably like, his best game, and I will I will throw down on that one. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So but but Alex, this is this is it for you. Oh yeah. What? I am I'm on a plane in about seven hours, headed back to Albuquerque and working the same day. So that's gonna be fun times. Well bummer. Yeah, bummer. Uh, bummer to miss out, but I'm glad I was able to make it out in the first place because it didn't look like I was gonna be able to come at all, and then it led to a wild series of misadventures, mostly involving Matthew. Old man grumpy Matthew over there. Just sitting there with his wolf ears. I think you're becoming Grumpy Alex. Oh, Raquel saying Grumpy Alex. It was almost... Well, I am mean Duke Alex. I am mean Duke Alex. It was almost like a a vignette of planes, trains, and automobiles. Have you seen that? Uh, No. Oh. Why'd you say yes? I haven't seen anything. Yeah, I know know, know that it's a movie. Maggie, he hasn't seen anything. I I remember this from the last conversation. Now I'm Grumpy. Yeah, no, he hasn't seen anything. John Candy, Steve Martin, fantastic movie. Misadventures of them... Unable to travel and, and there's so tra- many modes of uh, travel. You can just you have them all. Anyway, so Girl man Matthew has approached closer to the table with s- his wolf ears. I think s- he's gonna bite someone in the throat. <laughs> so I don't want to be a werewolf, Matthew. Don't do it. He says we're people. We're people are people too. So Alex, your final thoughts for the con? A lot of fun. Uh, it's it's interesting. I, I almost needed like a, a week to reflect on this, like a, a better recap a week from now. Okay. Just to kind of get some points of comparison, Dice Tower Con versus this con. All right. Uh, certainly bigger, uh, but there's some points I like about Dice Tower, Tower Con better and some points I liked about this better. So be interesting to compare and contrast. Game of the con for me, if I were to name it right this second, Ooh. Honshu. Okay. I think that was the, the best combination of things. It, it, it worked the best. Simple enough, but a lot of depth. I enjoyed that one a ton. I don't know if I'll feel that way a week from now, but at least if I'm thinking about it in this moment, current game of the con. Well, what's really interesting is when we first talked about Honshu two days ago, it hadn't been picked up, or at least it hadn't been announced that it's been picked up for U.S. distribution. And Renegade just announced today that it is picked up for U.S. distribution. So that's really cool. Very Re- Renegade's all over the place right they, now they in a good sure way. Are. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Maggie, any final thoughts for the con, or if you want to call an early game of the con? Oh, no, I don't want to call a game of okay, the con. Okay, fair enough. I do like Honshu, and I want to say that Blood of an Englishman from Renegade is really freaking good. Cool. Did you play it? No, I haven't played it okay. yet, but met met Dan, Dan Kassar, who's okay. the designer of that, and he designed Arboretum, which yeah. is an amazing game, uh, and we're going to be getting a copy of that from Renegade, too, so very excited yeah. to play keep, that. Keep, keep an eye out on that one, because that one's yeah. really good. Yeah, very excited for Blood of an Englishman, so... <laughs> All right. Well, Maggie, thanks for taking the time to join us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. All right. And Alex? Bye, Sean. See you in Albuquerque. Laters. Kisses.
November is well underway, and this is expected to be another busy release month for tasty minstrel games. TMG has four great titles expected to hit shelves this month, including Ars Alchemia, an anime-inspired worker placement game, Oracle of Delphi, Steffenfeld's take on the pick-up-and-deliver mechanic, Ponzi Scheme, a game about trying to perpetrate the greatest fraud on your investors, and the expansion to the smash hit Orleans, Orleans Invasion. Now, these November releases may be subject to change. One can never tell how magical energies, oracular visions, corrupt corporate stooges, or barbarian hordes can affect the release date. But when these games hit, be sure to check them out, because you'll be able to find something out there for every type of gamer. Check out TMG at PlayTMG.com. All right, well, it's currently Sunday morning. And we're going to do our Saturday recap. Well, as you heard last time, Alex left Saturday morning. So it's going to be me, but I'm being joined by Patrick Hillier from the What Did You Play This Week podcast thing. How are you doing, buddy? I am doing great. It's, uh, it's early Sunday, right? Yes, it is. It's uh, 828. <laughs> <laughs> and the main hall is pretty empty. There's probably, what, like maybe 40 people in here right now? Yeah, I'd say. Which, Unlike last night. Yeah, which was which was nuts because there was the closing ceremonies where just about everyone was here. 2,900 attendees total. Yes, that was awesome. That's that's pretty cool. So I'm going to be doing my Saturday recap, but uh, Patrick, if you want to talk about some of the hot stuff that you played this week, the, the highlights sure. of, uh, of the con. Um, but one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on in addition to you, you know, you being a contributor to the What'd You Play This Week podcast thing, man, that's such a mouthful. Yes, I know. Is uh, you were the generous winner of our item in the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund auction. Sure. Which uh, included uh, a copy of of Millennium Blades from our buddies over at Level 99. Yes. And we're going to be sending you some green chili. That's what I'm looking forward to. And some Albuquerque Company tortillas. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's going to be good. So a little Duke City care package. That would be great. But we also got to play a game. Uh, and so you asked to play with me and Alex and Suzanne. We were supposed to play Lords of Vegas. Yes. That is one of my top ten games. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it was checked out of the library when we went to get it, which is a big challenge here at BGG. They have this giant library with, what, 5,000 some uh-huh. games in it? Uh-huh. And uh, there's just certain things we can never play. Um, that was one of my goals here was actually to use the library more. And uh, every time I went in there to get something that I wanted, it wasn't available, unfortunately. <laughs> so, But that's okay. I had lots of other things to play. Well, I swear, I saw afterwards, after we couldn't play it, um, all day... Saturday, because we actually played on Friday, yes. but all day Saturday, uh, I saw I saw the library copy of Lords of Vegas like everywhere. Yes, like I saw people walking with it around the hall. I saw someone leaving it with, with it from the library. Like it was just taunting me because well, it's it's probably a top I'd say top twenty game for me. Yeah, I love Lords of Vegas. Yeah, it is one of my favorites, and and I really liked the uh, interview you guys did with with uh, Mike. Oh, with Mike, Mike yeah. Selinger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, Alex did a, did a great job on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did play Terraforming Mars instead. Right, that's a close second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh shucks. <laughs> Um, Fortunately, I had my copy from Gen Con, uh-huh. so we didn't have to fight over the the uh, unavailable <laughs> copies of that that are around here either. So I I I don't know that it's been the the, the game I've seen most out on the tables. A lot of it, though. But it's, I've seen a ton of Terraforming Mars. How many times did you play it this week? Uh, I played it three times, and I'm okay. talking about playing it yet. <laughs> yeah, one more time before I get out of here. Nice, nice. So yeah, it's it's one of my favorites of this season whatever you want to call right. it this year whenever it came out this year so yeah so we've talked about it a couple times on the show mm-hmm. and uh basically you're you're trying to terraform mars you're trying to add water to the surface you're trying to increase the temperature and to increase the oxygen level right and you do that through this interesting card play yes uh and resource management there's some engine building because you're building up income and in, in the different resources and so it, for those that like engine building I think it's it's a lot of fun. Yes, yes, for, definitely for sci-fi enthusiasts uh-huh. like myself. Yep, um, who's read Kim Stanley Robinson? In fact, they they make a lot of mention of that in in the rule book that this was you know I think they even thank Kim Stanley Robinson. Sure, for the inspiration. Yeah, and 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 I think I think there's a good strong theme to it, and it and it builds on it over time. You know, sure, that you start off and you're you're doing mining and you're doing. You know, these asteroids are hitting, and you're just starting to get water in it. And then once you get enough water, you can you can grow algae, and then eventually you can put plants on it and, and cities. And, and and I just feel that that growth is what makes that game exciting, too, as well as the engine building part of it. Yeah. And it really ramps up. I mean, it starts off slow, but, that, that <laughs> you know, we saw it when we played that 
that end of the game just kind of just speeds up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting, too, is I think we had two cities on Mars yeah. by the end of the game, which is, so far, I think the lowest city count sure. in a, in a four-player game that I've seen. Yes. That was pretty weird. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. We had, like, eight on the game I played yesterday. So. Okay. Yeah, it just it definitely varies. That's the really other interesting about the thing about the game is just it's just so every game is so different. Right. And I think and I think just seeing those that com the combination of cards that you're putting together um, and just the the new and interesting ways that they combine I think is a lot of the appeal for me. I mean, I think sure. I think the replayability of the game is tremendous. Yes. I mean, just tremendous. I've pl I've played it I think eight times now. Right. And I feel like I have barely scratched the surface. But you've played a lot more than that. Yeah, I think I'm working on probably 25. Yeah. And I would say at least half of those are solo because I really, really enjoy it solo. Okay. Uh, so you, you can play each of the corporations solo and then you try to beat a, you know, beat a score or uh, you play it within 14 rounds and then there's a leaderboard on Board Game Geek. Oh, cool. Of people who've you know, posted the highest score, so there's kind of a, a goal to try to beat sure. every time. So I've actually beaten the designer in, <laughs> in, in one category. That's it. So, so that's so what, kind of fun. So what's your high score? <sighs> like 124 Holy in cow. one of the... But in solo, it's completely different. Okay, okay. It's completely different. Like... You know, all of my multiplayer games are in, like we did, you know, we were, what, 60 to 61? It was like 66 to 71. To 71. A really, yeah. really tight game right, for the but, four of us. Yeah, but, you know, yesterday we did the same thing. It was 70-something. Yeah, any any multiplayer games are in the lower ranges, but right. when you're playing solo, it's a little different. You can really build up some different engines and do some different things. Yeah, so I played uh, the, one of the corporations I haven't played previously, which was the one that starts with a lot of money, and then whenever you... Uh, whenever you build something that costs twenty or more, you get four bucks back. Yeah, and I felt aimless. Yes, that's a little hard one. Yeah, I felt completely aimless, and uh, but it was interesting, and I wound up going a heavy uh, plant animal mm -hmm. microbe strategy. Yeah, I don't think the corporations really, you know, force you to go any other no, direction. No, they definitely right. help and make it interesting. Yeah. But they're not required. They give you incentive, yeah. a lot of them, yeah, they do. To, to do something. Mm -hmm. um, and you hadn't drafted before, because there's a drafting variant, because yes. that sort of be true, you draw four cards, yes. and you choose which ones you want to play. What did you think of the draft? I thought it was great. Yeah. I think that really helped a lot. I want to do that every time. And, and I actually talked to some people who think there's no reason to not even do that with new people. Yeah. I, I, th I think so. I feel like, at least with new people, it, I mean, the only reason I guess would be it's slower. Yes. Once you're seeing all, like, you're, they're reading all these new cards. They're right. reading uh, 10 new cards a turn instead yeah. of four. But that also would help them kind of get a feel for the kind of cards that are out there and available. Right. But yeah, for the most part, I feel like I want to draft every every time. Mm -hmm. um, because then you're less, you're less um, I don't know, you're less beholden to, to bad draws, I guess. Right. So what we, what we kind of talked about since then was... Maybe using for new people anyway, which is what we did with my second, my last game, was uh, we started everyone at one, yeah. which is kind of the other starting game mm -hmm. you know, technique. So that gives everybody sort of a head start. Sure. And then go ahead and do drafting. So you're kind of making up for that lost time. Okay. So you start everybody with a little bit oh, of a yeah. head start, and then you do the drafting, and then that, you don't have that long, that long of a game. Because the game does... Sometimes does last a little too long for what it is. Yeah. Um, what was our game? Almost three hours. Yeah. With a long break. Oh yeah, we had about a twenty-minute break in there. So. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have a problem with playing a three-hour game. I'm sure, not saying sure. that, but sometimes that takes a little too long. So. Yeah. No, absolutely. The highlight of my other terraforming night, Mars game was was with um, Paul Grogan, Jonathan Cox, uh, Isaac Childress, uh, and uh, Ryan Laflamme, and um, uh, Dan Newman. So here I am teaching, you know, yeah, <laughs> Grogan and because uh, they never played it before and designers and, and, and yeah, 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 yeah. So that was that was that was a little, you know, but you know, they did okay. <laughs> they seem to they seem to understand. So that, that was fun. Anyway, uh, what else have I been doing? Let's see. Uh, I played role player last night. So yeah. uh, I'm a I'm you know I uh, what was the movie though? Stranger Things. I sure. was one of those kids sure. in the basement playing Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> as a kid. You know, I tweeted out to my friends that hey, that was us. They had secret cameras on us when we were <laughs> when we were playing. Uh, so I'm all about that. 
idea of rolling up character. Oh, and that's yeah. all the game is, right? Yeah. It was so funny. Last night, Kimberly was playing it with us, and she's like, all right, so when do we actually start playing the game? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, really, Kimberly, this is the game. Yeah. The game is the idea of rolling up your character. That's it. So uh, I didn't actually do very well, but... Um, I really, I really enjoyed the concept of it. It was pretty cool. I want to, I want to get into it some more. So yeah, no, absolutely. I brought out my copy, and uh, I played it three times here at the con. And okay. With, with big, big success with everyone, with everyone I showed it to. Yes, I've seen a lot of that here too. Yeah, yeah. Um, role player, role player is fantastic. Um, so I got to play La Granja, the dice game. Oh, I didn't even see that from uh, from Stronghold Games. They they brought it over, and they had uh, they had a number of copies in the in the booth, but they sold out pretty quickly. Yes. On Thursday, and actually, I was in line with uh, with our buddy Matthew and with Suzanne for the flea market yesterday. And so while we were waiting, she stickered all of her dice because you have to <laughs> sticker the, yes. the ten dice or so in La Granja. Uh, the dice game, or no siesta is what, it, what yes, it's called. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and so we played, and it was really interesting, and it really condensed that whole La Granja experience down to a, a fairly quick but still somewhat deep dice game. It uh, it really focuses on the dice drafting element of La Granja, which is you know maybe one-fourth or one-fifth of the game. Okay. And uh, so, so the first person rolls, everyone drafts one, and then you roll again, everyone drafts one, so you'll get two dice, and then whatever die is remaining, everyone gets to use as a communal die. And so all you're doing is collecting uh, different harvest goods, pigs, donkeys, money, uh, little siesta hats. Well, they're not really called siesta hats, but they're called hats. Okay. And, uh, um, and then you're trying to fill in on your little your sheet, because you have to fill in with, with pen, or, pen or pencil, and fill in your sheets different items like there's a market thing or yeah market thing where you're trying to fill things in in order to get some end game bonuses there's a roof track where you're getting these one-time uses um there is the helper track where you're getting some ongoing abilities which is pretty cool and it captured a lot of what lagranja is in i'd say maybe a 40 minute game okay um you don't have i mean you don't have the multi-use cards that uh, that are probably one of my favorite parts. You don't have the whole market delivery uh, that's similar to um, Seffenfeld's. Why am I blanking? Not like East. Why am I blanking? Luna. Luna. Okay. Uh, took a second. And um, yeah, it was really interesting, and we had we had some fun with it. Uh, good production. The dice are fine. I mean, you have to sticker them, but. Yeah. But oh well. But it was yeah. interesting. I, I did enjoy it, and I'm glad I picked up a copy. Is it a lot of randomness, though, with it being dice, or does that an issue? Well, there's some mitigation. So, like, one of your helpers, and it feels like it's the first helper you always get, lets you move what you get from one spot to the next. So there's a little bit of mitigation. Um, it didn't feel super random, and there's always something for you to, to do with your... Uh, with your, the resources that you get, sure. so you always have options, and so it's just how how efficiently can you do it, and it was good. Okay. So that's uh, La Granja No Siesta. That sounds great. Yeah. I didn't even. God, I didn't even. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, what was the first day? It was crazy, right? The line yeah. was out the door for people to go in and shop, and that first aisle was both the Funnigan booth. Yep. And. Stronghold, yep. and it was a zoo. Yeah, and I just sort of like I'm not going down there. <laughs> uh, there was nothing I really needed. Um, right. I did actually end up going back into the stronghold. Uh, I mean, not the stronghold. Uh, I did go back to stronghold, but I ended up going back to um, fun again. I picked up um, Mondrian dice and okay. coffee roaster. Okay, just as two small things. I'm flying here. This is unusual for me to fly to a con. So I don't buy as much here. I yeah, just, you know, kind of limit myself to a few few purchases <laughs> that I can fit into a suitcase. So I usually do my huge shopping hauls at Origins and, and Gen Cons. Uh, another fun game I played was a kids game uh, from Amigo called Mino and Tari. And uh, I don't even know how to describe this. So you have a vertical maze that you cannot get through. That is vertical. Uh, that is uh, uh, has a magnetic characters on either side, and you are trying to get through the maze in a manner similar to uh, La Boca. So you have to communicate um, with each other. So you go up through part of the maze and then get blocked off, and then you have to tell your partner, okay, uh, I can't go left. Can you get us left? And then your partner can move, could possibly move through their part of the maze because their maze is different on their side. Uh, and you take turns moving these characters with, that are connected through magnets back and forth until you get to the uh, goal of the maze. 
And, uh, it, you know, it's, it comes across as a kid's game, but uh, we had a lot of fun as adults, as always, playing kids' games. Yeah, sounds, it's, sounds really cool. It's, it's really cute, and it's got a really great uh, uh, toy and production value from, from Amigo. So Okay. Uh, so the other week, we reviewed Clank from Renegade Games, and I had a bunch mm -hmm. of people in the guild say, well, hey, you should check out Tyrants of the Underdark, because it's another deck builder that then has you do stuff on the board. Okay. And this is a Wizards of the Coast production. It's uh, Tyrants of the Underdark, which is set in the Forbidden Realms world, same thing as Lords of Waterdeep, uh, and the different, you know, Legend of Drist and, and yeah. that, that stuff. And you are a drow, a drow noble or whatever, and you're trying to take control of the Underdark. And so it's, there's an area control element. There's these pathways, and you're spending your resources, which are swords and shields, I forget what that's called, inf force or something, and then influence. Influence is your buy, what you're buying from, from a market row. And then the swords and shields, you could spend three of those to kill an enemy, uh, a neutral or an enemy model where you have presence. And then there's another, uh, oh yeah, so three to kill, Three to remove a spy that uh, this kind of gets in your way, and then one to just deploy a troop out. And the game ends when one person's deployed all their troops, or when you run through the market cards, and then you're going to add up the points in your deck as normal. You're going to add up points for, for the, um, the troops that you've killed. And then there's also this cool deck thinning thing called promotion, where uh, instead of just kind of trashing a card completely, you, if you have card effects that say promote a card to your inner circle, and now you get an increased value for your cards that are in your inner circle. So okay. your starter cards are, are all worth zero points in your deck. If you promote them, they're worth a, a point. A oh. piece. So it was really interesting. I really enjoyed Clank, um, and I really enjoyed this too. I really prefer a deck builder where you're doing something. You're not just deck building for the I sake agree. of deck building. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of area control games, and so this this was really good. I kind of um, I kind of avoided this for the last couple months because I'm like, eh, I don't know that that sounds that interesting to me. Yeah. But I really enjoyed it, and uh, mm. and everyone else seemed to enjoy it too. I came in last. Okay. But that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. It was it was a lot of fun. So I'm it's something I'm probably going to pick up at some point in the near future. That's interesting. It was, it was pretty solid. Yeah, I've been hearing about it, but I haven't really paid much attention to that game yet. So. Yeah. Yeah, Clank was another uh, hot game that I was not able to get my hands on yeah yeah i saw a lot of clank on the table mm -hmm. this weekend too yeah you know i'm uh, one of my shticks is you know my my twitter's over the hill here so i'm an old guy i like to play a lot of <laughs> old games the other game i played a lot of is cribbage okay cool <laughs> yeah you ever played cribbage i, I have i love cribbage. okay yeah i always carry a cribbage board it, its history is uh jeff engelstein talked about cribbage on his show ludology yeah. a few years ago and said he had never played it and I said, well, I'm going to put it in my bag, and someday I'll teach you. I've yet to actually hold them up, up, up on that. But that whole Twitter conversation brought out cribbage players uh, on Twitter. Yeah. And so uh, I have certain people that I just always like playing cribbage with. So we always play. Uh, I always have it with me, and it's you know a good, a good thing we can just play uh, for five or ten minutes between, between, between events. So. I, I'm checking my phone. I don't have cribbage on the phone. Oh. I, you, I my my last yeah. phone I had. Yeah. And it's yeah. on my it's on my tablet. It's on my iPad. Sure. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I love I love uh, cribbage. That's yeah, a good game. It's a good game. Uh, oh, I played uh, X Nimmed. How about that's for another silly new game? That's the uh, new version of of Six Nimmed. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't even know how to describe it. So. Yeah, Six Nimmed is a hard, Six Nimmed <laughs> base normal Six Nimmed is a hard enough game to describe. Yes, I know. So if it, I, you got to know how to play Six Nimmed to talk about X Nimmed, right? <laughs> So now there's a row with a three, a four, and a five. Okay. Okay. So now those rows complete when you get three cards in them, four cards in them, and five cards in them okay. instead of six. Sure. All right. When and then you have your own personal row at the bottom, which has an X. Okay. When you complete a row, you have to put one of those cards in the row in the bottom. And 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 the rest back in your hand. Okay. At the end of the game, all of those cards at the bottom uh, count sequentially, and the bottom count against you. Mm -hmm. If when you take a row and you can't add to that bottom row sequentially, you have to flip them over and put them in another pile, and now they're worth, worth twice against you. Okay. So there's a sort of goal to when you take a row, not only do you want to take a row, but you have to figure out how it's going to fit in your bottom row. Makes sense. Because if you don't, you know, you're going to flip it over and you're going to, it's going to be worth, worse for you. So it's just, it's, it makes it even more of a brain yeah. burner. So it, 
it was hard. It was pretty hard to play. That sounds really interesting. I don't own yeah. Six Nymphed. I own the Walking Dead card game. Okay. Which is basically Six Nymphed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that sounds so X X, X Nymphed. Nymphed. Yeah, that's the new that's the new hotness out there in the Nymphed category. Oh, okay. cool. Okay, that sounds that sounds pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other things I got to play that that I saw out a lot too, also for Renegade Games, is Blood of an Englishman. Yes. Designed by Dan Kassar. Yes. Who designed Arboretum, which yes. is a, an amazing game, absolutely Love that amazing game. game. Mm-hmm. And Blood of an Englishman. We talked about on the show a couple weeks ago uh, news that Renegade was was releasing yes. it, and so I, I I got a copy and I got to play it and it was excellent. Yes. Um, one of you is Jack. One of you is the giant from the from the nursery. No, yeah, what's it? Yeah, uh, Jack and from the, the fable. What's but, whatever uh, it's called. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's early and it's been a long week. Um, so there are these five rows of cards that have beanstalk cards. They have. Uh, Two copies of three different types of treasure, goose, gold, and harp. Mm-hmm. And then there are some fee fi fo cards. Two, fee fi fo fum. fee fi fo fum cards, two of each. And so they're arranged in these five, five sacks of ten, 50 cards total. And Jack is able to take three moves. Jack can move a card from a front of a row to another front. He can take a card from the front or the back to put in his personal beanstalk, which has to be ascending numbers. Once he has six... He can then take the, one of the treasures if it's on the front or back, and uh, I'm missing I'm missing the other thing he can do. I think uh, um, he can move them from row to row. Row to row, yeah, front, front to front. back, and then from his oh right, row. yeah, that's right. He can move from he can move or no, he can move from back to front. Back to front, but can't move cards from front, front to, to back. back of a row. Mm-hmm. And so he has to get the three treasures out. Now the giant only gets to do one thing. They can the giant can mm-hmm. move four, exactly four cards from yes. the front of a stack to another front. They can move two cards front to front, um, or they can simply remove a beanstalk from from anywhere in in the, the rows. Right. Uh, and so the the giant wins if he can get all uh, four of the fee fi fo come fee fi fo fum cards <laughs> uh, together in like either in a clumped up uh, either horizontally or vertically. And uh, if if there are no legal ways for Jack to build his beanstalk, the giant wins. But otherwise, the Jack wins if he gets all three of yeah. the uh, of the treasures, and it is really interesting. Yes, it was and gorgeous. Oh yeah, it looks great. The same. I, I can't remember the name of the artist. Oh, it's the same guy that did Lotus. Lotus. Yes. yes, and I don't remember the person's name. I, I don't either. Um, but the art is beautiful. The gameplay was really good. It was a great, uh, great asymmetrical game. Yes. Um, and so it's I just two player. Yeah, just two player, and I and I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested to to play more. I played as the giant. I just barely beat Raquel. Okay. She was basically one action away from winning, and uh, but it was solid. It was it was really good. And you played it too, right? Yeah, I played against Dan, and he creamed me. Okay. <laughs> I, I w- well, yeah. All right, fair it's enough. To be expected. Yeah. So uh, I'm excited to to get that to the table some more, and I know Raquel Raquel liked it a lot. Let's talk about Fabled Fruit. Have you played Fabled Fruit? I have not played Fabled Fruit. <laughs> I have played another Freedom of Freeze game called Fuji Flush, but that's a whole different game. Okay. But anyway, let's talk about Fabled Fruit. Fabled Fruit is a card game. Uh, <laughs> you have six stacks of cards with animals on them, and each animal uh, has a special ability. And your goal, and it has a little recipe on the bottom, like turn in four, three strawberries and, a, and any other wild card, and you get to take that animal. And um, so you start off with two cards, say a banana and a pineapple. And uh, as you move your characters around, you get to draw more fruit cards. And um, the interesting thing is uh, you start off with those six basic cards and those abilities. And as you take away cards, you, you buy those cards that you're playing to. There's like a stack of four of them. And as you buy those, new ones come out of this special deck. So the, the um, action selection spaces grow okay. uh, as the game goes. And then the... And then the original ones that came with the game get depleted as the game goes okay. on. Okay. Okay. Because you're actually taking them away. You're, you're earning them, and you're taking them as your your win pile. And so you play till four points, and that's kind of like just kind of a simple game. It's like this isn't that interesting. But the idea is is that then you could play it again, and you you discard all those cards that you played through, and then you play it again, and then you keep playing through this new deck as it develops. So. It's going to morph over time. So it's not exactly a legacy game, but right. it sort of changes as you play. And it's, going to, and it's going to change in a different way as you play. And there's like 60 different card types. Okay. So it's going to go on for a long time. We only played two games and got through one through like eight. 
Interesting. So it's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, it's something for, I want for a light. Yeah, yeah, it's something I wanted to get. A, yeah. I wanted to play here. It's a, another stronghold title. Yes. Um. So yeah, I, I definitely that's definitely on my radar. Yeah, I definitely want to check it out. Yeah. Um. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is not necessarily a game, uh, but the the flea market itself, which I mentioned Ooh. earlier. Did you go to the flea market this year? I did not go to the. I went to the virtual flea market. Virtual flea market. The regular flea market. Which I I I did last year the virtual flea market too. I sold a bunch of stuff and I just I didn't have time this year, unfortunately. But I had one goal at okay. the flea market, and that was to see if I could find a copy of Glory to Rome, the black box edition, which you're pulling out. Ah, you're pulling out the uh, European white the Europe- box. Ah, yeah. Uh, my buddy Matthew has that version. <laughs> and so we lined up two hours before it opened at 8 o'clock, and we went in, and I just made a mad dash around. My, my goal was just... Don't look at what everyone has. Just see who ha- if anyone has Glory to Rome. Yeah. And then, and then make it happen. All right. I got about four tables in, and I just sat, I asked one of the vendors, hey, do you know anyone has Glory to Rome? And he goes, oh, yeah, that guy has it over there. I turn around immediately. I go grab it. I pay the price that's printed on it, and that was it. I got it. And? So, and, and it's great. No, I got it here. What? The, what the, you going to tell us how much it was? It was, it was <laughs> 120 well, that was fair. I, I agree. I agree. I, I, w- I was I was prepared to pay more. Okay. Because it's been a Grail game. It's something yes. I've wanted. Um, and so yeah, I was. Prepared. This is this is on loan to me. This belongs to my my uh, <laughs> co-host, uh, who has it here. But I have the, I have the black box at home. Nice. So. Yeah. No. I I mean, Carl Schurich is one of my favorite designers. I love I love his card games. Motana is one of my absolute all time favorite yes. games. I love Glory to Rome. Yes. And so it's just been a grail game for, for a while now and I'm glad mm-hmm. I finally got it. I also picked up eighteen thirty. Okay. Got a good deal on that. Yes. And then I picked up uh, Age of Steam. Which, oh all right. Uh, I, like I got that. an okay deal on that. Okay. But uh yeah it was so it was it was good. It, oh yeah I I picked up a lot of little tiny things in the Yeah. So uh flea market's always fun. I always mm-hmm. like I like haggling. Oh, see, I don't. Okay, <laughs> I don't. We went to we went to Europe once, and they were like stunned that I bought everything at price. Yeah, you know. Yeah, because they like to haggle. And yeah. Like, oh, I, at me like, I love haggling. <laughs> I love haggling. Well, uh, so Patrick, any any final thoughts on on the con? It is a great con. Yeah. You know, I. Um, it was funny. It was la- uh, la- before I got here, I was considering not coming next year and maybe doing something different. Okay. But. You can't not come to BGG, man. Oh yeah, it's just, and and uh, that was the other thing I was saying last night. I was giving people hugs and kind of saying goodbye. And sure. I'm starting to get teary eyed now. <laughs> it's just like it's very emotional because it's summer camp. It's yeah. better than I don't know. It's not. I don't know. It's just it's a very personal con. Yeah, it is so small yeah. and intimate. Yeah, um, everyone here is so serious. I mean, that's not, that's I guess <laughs> I, not serious about it, but I mean, you know, what I mean, they're yeah. I, I t- we talked about it on our show a little bit. It's like you know, you're not getting people off the street coming right. into to BGG, right? Exactly. You know I mean, everyone is here with a purpose. Yeah. So, and we're all friends on Twitter the mm-hmm. rest of the year. Mm-hmm. So we only see each other once a year or so, and um, and it's it's great. So I read an article a, a while back about how as you get older, it's it's a lot more difficult to make. To make friends, mm-hmm. um, that the friends that you make in, in you know high school, college college age, that are like you know like bl- like bl- blood brothers and sisters, right? Okay, yeah. And you you do everything together, and then as you get older, that tends to tends to happen a lot less. It's harder to make friends. Yeah. And then the friends you have become your oh this is my racquetball buddy, okay. or this is my I mean it's kind of focused, and so I think it's interesting that um, that board gaming has allowed allowed me to make friends locally sure. and then across social media oh, and then gosh. when we finally do get to you know get together it's really cool and it's really it's awesome a different experience than that I don't think I would have otherwise no. I mean I'd have some other hobby but I don't know that it would it would rise to this level no so I think it's no. pretty cool it's pretty amazing yeah yeah and we were talking too about it felt like as people were saying goodbye last night, like oh their parents are here to pick them up from camp <laughs> <laughs> it is so, you know and and uh, you know, it, it, just some advice to people as they come to cons. It's like you, you gotta, you gotta, you can't do everything. Yeah. You know, there's only I don't know, whatever <laughs> five times twenty four <laughs> hours while we're here. You can't, you can't stay awake forever. Yeah. You're not gonna play all the games. You're not gonna play games with everybody. And if you can, if you can come into it, just being happy with whatever you did. Sure. Which is what I am. 
Uh, I'm, you know, I saw a lot of people. And what I, I mean, you're on my Facebook, right? Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I've got, <laughs> I've got 50 pictures of people. Oh yeah. And about five pictures of games. Oh yeah. I've got because that's you've what this been tagged is for by me. Patrick Hillier. Right. Yeah. That's what I do. Cool. This is this is all about me hanging out with friends. Yeah. Uh, the games are, the games are why we're here, but it's who we're playing with. That's all. That's all it is for me, man. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, I want to thank you for, for coming on and talking with us a little bit. And yep. also, again, thank you for your generous donation to the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund auction. Really do Thanks appreciate that. Thanks for putting that, that up. You Absolutely. Know, I, like to, uh, I like to donate to that cause. And we would have, just for the record, we would have played a game with you. I know free. that. I know that is. <laughs> That is not why I, I know. That is not I know. why I be. I know. It's for a great cause. It's, it's all about the cause. All right. We'll have a safe trip back. Thanks. Have a great week. All right. It's Sean again, and I'm back here in the Duchy. I'm here in the Duke City, as Alex would say, ah, Albuquerque. I can't do it. Anyway, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, we f- just got back uh, a couple hours ago, flew in, said hi to the girls uh, and Carmen, uh, Raquel's mom, who was watching them this week, and uh, gave Mariah her present, her Attack on Titan deck building game because she loves Attack on Titan. We gave Chewie a bunch of random cards because that's the, she doesn't know any better yet, but uh, both super excited, and it's great to be home. But, uh, of course, it's always sad to, to leave so many friends and so much fun and just kind of that feeling of, you know, it's vacation and you're able to just kind of do whatever for a couple of days, no, not worrying about jobs and things like that. So um, just a couple of things before we kind of – well, before I wrap this up, I want to talk about some other experiences I got to have there. One of the friends of the show that I got to hang out with was Mike Canavan, and uh, Mike is actually one of our Patreon backers, uh, Patreon Dukes, and he was on a couple episodes ago, uh, and he also – he runs Icarus Tours and Rocky Mountain Gaming Vacation. And they had uh, he had he was at Stronghold's booth. Stephen Bonacorn uh, invited him to to come at, come to the booth, and they did a giveaway for a trip to Rocky Mountain Gaming Vacation in June, which I'll be going to, which Alex went last year. And so it was really great to hang out with Mike. And uh, you know, because I've I've I met him last year at BGG Con, but I got to play a bunch of games with him and just got to hang out with him, and and it was just a great experience. So. If you are interested in going to Breckenridge, Colorado next June for an amazing time, according to Alex, and I'm sure I'll be saying that again uh, a couple months from now, then please sign up now. Spaces are incredibly limited. He had a ton of signups there at the con and just want to get the word out to any Duke listeners out there that uh, we'd love to have you there. love to play games with you. love to meet you. So definitely go check that out. Uh, Rocky Mountain Gaming Vacation. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. So please check that out. Uh, also, while I was there, I got to uh, I got to meet Mike Primo, and Mike works for the Canadian Broadcasting Company. He's putting together a show. It's called uh, Knights of the Game Table, and I believe on Twitter it's at uh, at uh, at G Table Podcast, I think. And he so he's got uh, he just actually released his second episode. And what's really cool about this show is that it has this kind of uh, it's it's Canadian public radio, right? So it has this kind of here in the States, our NPR kind of feel. So it's telling a story and there's narration interspersed in very different from what, what we do and what most board game podcasts do. So Mike's Mike's show is kind of telling a story. Well, anyway, I got to, I got to, play a bunch of games with Mike and got to hang out with Mike, got to know him a little bit better. We had played a game online in the past, but but now I actually got to hang out with him, go to dinner, which was a lot of fun. And then one of the mornings, I can't even remember now, we did a round table uh, with Mike that that he had, along with Stephanie Straw, Rodney Smith, uh, Suzanne Sheldon, Marty Cannell, and Mina Gubernick. And it was kind of about um, about social media and and what it's done for the hobby and, and the dangers of it and things like that. So that was really fun to kind of talk with everyone and 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 be able to contribute to that. Something very cool. So I'll put a link in the show notes to his show as well. Uh, definitely worth checking out. I haven't listened to the second episode yet. The first episode was fantastic. I'm very excited to listen to the second episode this week. Also, I did get one more play in of a game this morning before we left, and that was a two-player game with Joe. Uh, he, on Twitter, he's at GeekyGamerJoe, and we've been tr- we were trying to hook up a game of, of Feast for Odin all week, and we're finally able to make it my very last game of the con. We just played two-player, and his first game, my second game, I got some, I got some of the rules wrong. I got them correct in the past, but I will go ahead and blame it on um, lack of sleep, and trying to get through the game quickly because I was on a time crunch, but uh, but it was still a great experience. I'm really enjoying Feast for Odin. We'll see if we're going to review that or not in the near future. I'm not sure if that's if that's in the works, but definitely a possibility. A fantastic game from Uwe Rosenberg. I've talked about it before 
on the show briefly where uh, basically worker placement and there's some senior people, the worker placement spots, you can place one, two, three, or four, depending on which actions. There's lots of getting materials to turn into other materials. And ultimately you're putting them on a grid on your, your main player board and fitting in like Tetris, kind of like, like Uwe's, Uwe's other game, uh, Patchwork. Awesome game. Really, really enjoyed that. Enjoyed playing with Joe. He's a, he's a cool guy. And I'm glad we got to kind of meet up and, and play a game together. Lastly, I guess I'd just like to say to, to everyone that I got to, to, to meet uh, or to see again or to hang out with, whether they were media people, whether they were publishers, whether they were vendors, whether they were fans of the, of the show. Um, it's just such an awesome time. I, I really do enjoy this. And I, I just encourage listeners out there that haven't gone to a con before to at some point, you know, time permitting, money permitting, life permitting, and all that. It's just such a great experience. It's such a great experience, especially if you're if you're connected to the industry. I don't mean connected, connected, connected. I just mean if you participate in social media, if you tweet at people, if you're on Facebook and whatever, and you establish these relationships that are long distance, and then you're able to kind of build on that and create friendships from, uh, you know, at these cons. And so like, you know, like Suzanne, our, our good friend, Suzanne, the, the very first honorary Duke, although wait, she's not an honorary Duke, full Duke. Um, you know, we get to see her a couple times a year and it's just great. It's like, I mean, well, we are old friends at this point. And so it's, it's great having and being able to build more and more of those relationships. And so I really encourage it, um, because it's a whole different atmosphere. There are so many people I got to, I got to meet, and play games with that uh, I talk with all year. And it's just such a great opportunity. I, and I, I really do enjoy that. Um, I'm not going to list off a bunch of names because you know, that would take too long. And I would, would undoubtedly leave someone out. So BGG Con 2016, in the books, total success. Had a ton of fun. Played a lot of great games. Picked up Glory to Rome, Black Box Edition. Yes, Grail game. Ah, fantastic. Now, very last thing, just a little bit of show business, and really it's more show business for our buddies over at the Draft Mechanic Podcast. I was actually sad to learn that they're not going to be out here this summer, or not this summer, that they're not going to be out here this Christmas for the holidays. They came out last year. Apparently, they switch off families, so next year they'll be coming out. But anyway, we are getting ready to wrap up the Fantasy Board Game League. We're in the playoffs now. The 11 weeks of regular season are over, and let me check the score here. Oh, I have the highest point total. I am the first seed in the playoffs, which I'm very excited about. So there's four teams left, and we're going to do two weeks head-to-head, and then the finals. This week, I am playing against Eric Lang's Pinky Finger, which is the name of Danielle from Draft Mechanics team. Very formidable team. My team is, of course, the duke doodle doos which is fun to say. And uh, so what you can do, though, you can help participate. So this is there's going to be a bunch of scoring based on... Uh, game ranking and plays and things like that. But people out there can help contribute. They can go to draftmechanic.net. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Click on Fantasy Board Game League and you can vote on the matchup. Which either which team's better or which team you want to win, etc. cetera. Uh, vote, vote Sean. Vote uh, Duke Doodle Doo. Duke. Vote Duke Doodle Doos. But what's cool is you're going to get entered into a drawing for a $100 gift certificate to Cool Stuff, Inc. That buys a ton of board games. So definitely check that out. And you get an entry. If you've been doing this all along every week, you've gotten an entry for every single week. And with the two weeks remaining, you can you can get two entries, which is which is pretty cool. So uh, also Matthew, our buddy Matthew and Quentin from Boards Alive are in the in the playoffs as well. They're going head to head. And so I'm I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I've got a solid team. And uh, hopefully I'm going to bring back the inaugural Fantasy Board Game League trophy to the duchy. Yeah, let's do it. So go vote. Vote early. Vote often. Future Robot Sean here. Quick programming note. The Dukes will be taking their first ever week off next week as they celebrate the American Thanksgiving holiday with their families. But we'll be back with a vengeance on December 5th. Well, that's going to do it. Thank you again, everyone, for listening, for checking out pictures on Twitter and uh, chiming in on the Guild. Really do appreciate it. So for Alex and for me, Sean, thank you very much and hail Hydra. Thank you so much for listening to the Dukes of Dice. Today's episode was recorded at BGGCon 2016. Our theme music is provided by Carbohydro M from his Prime Legacy album. The Dukes of Dice are a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. For other great board gaming podcasts, check out DiceTowerNetwork.com. And for all the latest in the duchy, go to DukesofDice.com. Find us on Twitter at Dukes of Dice. 
Join in conversations on our Board Game Geek Guild. Find us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks to our sponsors, Tasty Minstrel Games and Meeple Realty. Check out all their awesome titles at playtmg.com. And for high-quality board game inserts, check out MeepleRealty.com. Meeple Realty, think inside the box. We'll see you back here in two weeks. Until then, game on.